in this unit, we're going to start exploring the tree of life, looking at organisms as simple and old um, as bacteria all the way up to our very recent uh, looking at human evolution. Now, this particular unit, we're going to start off with um, viruses, and I'm going to mention those more in just a moment, then bacteria, then moving our way up to protists and fungi and plants, and then we're going to explore animals a lot more in our next unit. Now, the reason this slide is titled Tree of Life and Viruses is because viruses aren't really considered alive, but they're still important to understand because they have such a direct impact on organisms' lives. Obviously, us as humans, we get impacted by viruses, but also looking at other organisms, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, they all get infected by viruses. So while maybe not traditionally traditionally considered alive, still have a huge impact on the living. But before we explore viruses, let's talk a little bit more about what it means to be alive. You know, why don't we consider viruses to be alive? Why don't we consider rocks to be alive? Now, some of these you probably already know, but maybe didn't realize these were unique characteristics of the living. So one, made of cells. Cells are the basic building block of life. What those cells look like depend on the organisms. We'll look at prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. We're going to explore um, differences between plants and animals and fungi and their cell structure. But no matter what, made of cells, they have a plasma membrane that have organelles, uh, or in the case of prokaryotes, lack of organelles, but they have cells. To be alive, you need to reproduce. How you reproduce varies greatly through living organisms, but it is um, unique to these organisms. Now, this is where viruses are a little kind of iffy because they do reproduce in the sense that they do make more copies of themselves, but they themselves cannot do it alone. They have to hijack a cell and take advantage of the proteins, the organelles, uh, and the different structures within a cell to actually reproduce. So this is one of the reasons uh, why viruses are not considered to be alive, as well as they don't have cells. And we're gonna explore that more soon. Organisms or things that are considered alive respond to their environment. And this response, honestly, is a survival response. So things that are alive try to stay alive. Now, I this simple picture came up with just these uh, lionesses hanging out in shade. But the reason they're in shade is because it's really hot out. And if you are staying in a very hot environment for a long period of time, you might have to start worrying about dehydration, um, heat stroke. Um, and that's not just for humans, but for other organisms as well. So the way they respond to that stimulus is going in the shade. But other things too, plants respond to sunlight as well and will literally grow towards the most direct light source. So being able to respond to the environment to live in ideal conditions or better conditions. Things that are alive also grow and develop. Now, grow doesn't necessarily need to be um, growing in size, um, but it just means that there's essentially a, a beginning, a middle, and end of life. Things like bacteria also have a beginning, a middle, and end. Their cell cycle differs through the lifetime of those cells. Humans, obviously, kind of a lot easier to, to imagine, but all living organisms have a growth and development, um, I guess, cycle in their life. They are not the same exact thing. That rock is not the same exact thing from when it started um, to when it ended, or it is the same exact thing. Whereas cells, they're, they're not. Um, through growth, through reproduction, through cellular processes, they change uh, and composition may change. And then finally, all living things have to obtain and use energy. Now, there's tons of ways that this can be accomplished um, through photosynthesis, through cellular respiration, to, um, uh, to um, chemotrophs and autotrophs and heterotrophs. There's lots of different styles of ways to get energy, but no matter what, they need energy. And we can even make it more direct. They need ATP, right? How they create that ATP could differ, uh, but in the end, they need ATP. They need energy in order to do a lot of these cellular processes. So this is what it means to be alive. These are the characteristics of living organisms. 
but let's start talking about viruses. Now, viruses do have some of those characteristics, but in order to be considered to be alive, you need to have all of them. And as I mentioned before, the reason we're exploring viruses is because they have such a intimate relationship with the living um, and have a very large impact on the living. So some characteristics of viruses is one, they're incredibly small. And let me give you kind of some scale. So this right hand image, this red thing is a large red eukaryotic cell. This blue cell you see is the typical size of a bacteria. And then these red little dots, those are representing viruses. So you can see incredibly small compared to say, if it's something infecting humans, a eukaryotic cell. There are viruses that attack bacteria. So even small, can even at the bacterial level. Viruses are also acellular, meaning they're without cells. Really what they are, um, and I'm gonna come back to that second bullet point in a second, pretty much viruses are just proteins. They're, they're a matrix of proteins that give them their shape. And then they have a, some sort of nucleic acid core inside of a protein shell. That nucleic acid can be one of either of two different nucleic acids. It could be DNA or RNA. We'll explore that more soon. But that's pretty much all a virus is. Now, there is a little bit more to it, and there's a wide variety of viral shapes. This class, we're not really going to explore that. Uh, if you take a microbiology course, you'll, you'll, you will learn a whole lot more about virus shape and structure. But for simplicity's sake, or not even simple, but generally, you've got a protein capsid and you've got a nucleic acid. Now, viruses also cannot reproduce on their own. So they do replicate. They do make more copies of themselves. They just can't do it. They literally lack essentially the mechanical hardware and software uh, to reproduce. They have to hijack another cell and the cell has to make more viruses. And we'll talk about how in the world that happens. Now you might be thinking, well, aren't there parasites out there that have to like rely on a host? Like, why do we consider them alive? Pretty much every single virus has, or sorry, every single parasite has the ability to reproduce on their own. It's just, they want the conditions of a host. They're getting their nutrition from the host, but they physically have the ability to do their own reproduction. They're not hijacking cells to reproduce. They're not hijacking the proteins and the organelles and cells to reproduce. They just might be in a cell because they like the, the environment that is within that cell. But viruses cannot do it at all by themselves. They do rely on the organism's cellular matrix and cellular network in order to reproduce. So the next couple of slides, what we're gonna explore is virus morphology. And morphology means just what is the shape and structure of a virus? As I mentioned before in a microbiology course, you're gonna learn a lot more about this. I'm just gonna kind of generalize the most common types of virus morphological states and kind of what they mean in regards to health, like human health. So in general, we have two different categories of viruses um, based on, I guess, the overall structure of a virus. So the previous slide showed you a non-enveloped virus. Here in this picture, all this green is representing that protein that is the um, protein capsid holding in those orange strands, in this case representing a nucleic acid core. But the other type of virus, which you haven't seen yet, is an enveloped virus. So looking at this image, this cone shape, this green cone shape, that is a protein capsid. That yellow is the nucleic acid. But in addition to this, it has something on the outside. It has a plasma membrane. We're gonna learn more about this soon, but this plasma membrane is actually stolen from a host cell. So this plasma membrane might actually be the membrane from a human host. This could be a human liver cell plasma membrane. We'll talk about how it gets that plasma membrane soon, but this is what it means to be enveloped. The envelope that is around this virus is a cellular membrane from its host. Whereas a non-envelope virus is just that protein shell. There is no cellular membrane around it. 
I mentioned before that we can have um, two different types of nucleic acids found within a virus. It really just depends on what virus it is. So one type of, <clears throat> excuse me, one type of nucleic acid is DNA. That's what our cells, us as humans have. DNA, just as a reminder um, from maybe your previous classes, DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid. I won't test you on that, but if you're trying to remember what it means. It's a double-stranded molecule, and it's a pretty stable molecule. One, because of that double-strandedness, those nucleotides aren't exposed to the um, rest of the cellular environment, so it's more protected within those double strands. But also, when DNA goes to replicate any time that cell divides, the protein DNA polymerase, the one that is adding those new nucleotides to that copy of DNA, it proofs reads it. So if DNA polymerase makes a mistake, and it does, it does make mistakes, it has this proofreading ability where it can go back and be like, oh, I accidentally put an A, I was totally supposed to put a G. It can go back, it can remove the wrong nucleic new nucleotide and it can re-add the correct one now it's not still still with that proofreading it's still not 100 percent the most accurate but that is a really nice proofreading ability and it helps reduce the amount of mutations that are passing on to the next cell so if you have a virus that has a dna core its mutation rate is going to be pretty low because every time that dna gets copied it's getting proofread and so there's not going to be many changes that happen viruses can also be rna based with their rna based it means it mutates faster and the reason it mutates faster is because when rna polymerase goes to copy rna RNA polymerase works very similar to DNA polymerase. It is putting the correct nucleotides on that matching template. However, RNA polymerase lacks that proofreading ability, which means that if it was supposed to put a C and it put an A, oh well, that mutation stays. There's no way for RNA polymerase to go back and fix its errors. So RNA and DNA polymerase make errors about at the same rate. It's just the thing is, is that DNA polymerase can fix those errors, while RNA polymerase can't. And so this results in a lot more mutations. And you've probably seen mutations like this. I'm making this video uh, during COVID times, and we are hearing about different strains of COVID uh, or coronavirus that is going around in different parts of the world. Well, maybe. It's related to it being DNA versus RNA or RNA versus DNA. I'll let you ponder um, which one you think you would be and why that would be. So those are the three major characteristics of viruses. Again, looking at if it's enveloped, which again is going to get from its host cell or non-enveloped. It could be a DNA core or it could be an RNA core. And the last characteristic we'll talk about, which is going to be on the next set of uh, next video, is related to the way it reproduces, the way it does make copies of itself. How does it hijack a cell? That'll be the third characteristic that we use in describing viruses. Again, a lot more characteristics that are out there, but those three properties are going to tell us a lot more about how viruses are going to infect other organisms and how they're going to make other organisms sick.